Good morning and welcome to the 19th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Um, I have apologies from committee member Gil Patterson. May I remind everyone to turn off any electrical devices that might interfere with the sound system or to turn the, their devices to silent, please. Item 1 is a decision by the committee to, to take item 3 in private. The committee need to decide whether consideration of its draft letter to the Scottish Government on draft energy strategy and a list of candidates for the post of advisor in connection with its forthcoming economic data inquiry should be taken in private at future meetings. So are we agreed that that should be done? Yes. Thank you. Now, may I welcome this morning our panel of witnesses who are here to talk to us about the draft energy strategy. And uh, first of all, going from my left to right, uh, Emma Kelso, who's a partner in energy systems Ofgem, uh, then Duncan Burt, who's the head of Operate the System Electricity from the National Grid. Barbara Vest, Director of en Generation Energy UK. And Professor Keith Bell, who is co-director of the UK Energy Research Centre. So welcome to all of you this morning. Um, I would like to start with a question about the uh, actions which are set out in the uh, energy strategy and I'm sure you'll all be familiar with it. One of the actions called for in the energy strategy is that um, the grid constraints for distributed power generation at local, regional, and national level should be addressed. And I'm just wondering if uh, any of you can comment on that. And I should say that uh, witnesses do not need to respond to every um, question, depending whether you feel you have something you want to contribute on that. And also there is the possibility to submit written evidence after the session if an issue arises which you'd be more comfortable dealing with on that basis. So who would like to start? Uh, Duncan Burt. Um, I mean, we very much agree that uh, the grid constraints uh, need to be addressed and indeed are being addressed. Um, there remain uh, constraints right across the Scottish network, particularly uh, from north of Inverness, uh, with, that will be corrected with the establishment of the Moray Firth HVDC link uh, coming in uh, over the next year, and with the completion of the Western uh, HVDC link from Glasgow down to Liverpool. Those two major investments by SSE for the first one and jointly by Scottish Power and National Grid for the second one will relieve the residual major national constraints on the electrical network in Scotland. It's important for the committee to recognise that there will remain individual, very localised constraints which may, present, may prevent uh, a new connectee uh, connecting to the grid in the short term. Um, I know, uh, working with Scottish Power and SSE, that they are working very hard to invest to remove those. Many of them are removed by a process called Connect and Manage, which was implemented uh, just under a decade ago in partnership with the, ourselves at National Grid, Ofgem and the Scottish Transmission Companies, which has removed most of the development risk uh, for connections from those parties. But there will remain some local constraints that are very much associated with the need to plan and consent uh, local upgrades for those connections. But it, it is an absolutely critical part of the investment environment that people understand those risks around planning and connection and that wherever possible, um, you know, in balance with uh, the democratic process around planning and construction, that those are removed. Thank you. Um, anyone else wish to comment on that? Well, I could just maybe add, uh, the removal of constraints is, is important. It has to be at the right level. So it should be at a level which is sort of economic. So the impact of having you know, some, some limited to, limits to the power flows on the network is you can't utilise the cheapest or the lowest carbon generation, you have to replace it with something else. But clearly the reinforcement of the network itself has a cost. So it is important that that balance is, is got right. Um, I know that the three transmission companies, so including National Grid and both the SO and TO parts, have got processes to try to undertake that cost-benefit analysis uh, it also applies, I think, at distribution network voltages. So, you know, one of the kind of parts that's highlighted in the energy strategy is about uh, local energy or community energy or smaller scale schemes, whatever their ownership is, but smaller schemes that connect into the distribution network. So I think there is room for improvement there across the whole of GB about um, the kind of the release of network capacity 
to prospective new, new users and doing that in the kind of most cost effective way. Like I say, the balance between extra network capacity and the impact of not always being able to use all of the available energy. So it's, it's a question of how much of the time and how much of the energy might not be used and what's the kind of what's the cost of that versus the cost of the upgrades and the planning permission for the upgrades as well, which is a big issue as well. Yes, yeah, certainly. I'm a Kelso. Just add briefly. Um, I mean, certainly second uh, what, what Keith and Duncan have had to say. Uh, we very much see uh, the investment which is already underway and, uh, and planned as, as very important. Uh, as a re economic regulator, it's really important for us that that investment is achieved in, uh, in as an economic and efficient uh, a, a way as possible. I think the other point to really note is that this isn't this isn't just a, a single issue to deal with once and for all. It's a constantly shifting uh, piece as we're seeing new technology, as we're seeing that transition in terms of our generation mix. It's something which we're going to have to constantly uh, keep our eye on and make sure uh, that we are addressing on an ongoing basis. Um, perhaps um, a follow-up question in terms of the energy strategy approach and the need for um, some overlap between the United Kingdom government's approach and the Scottish government's approach. Um, how realistic is the energy strategy approach, bearing in mind that there is overlap and some things may depend be dependent on a collaborative approach between the two governments going forward? Um, does anyone wish to make some politically neutral comments on this? <laughs> um, Barbara Vest, did you want well, to say yeah. something? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, I thought, you know, the, the strategy uh, it looks ambitious. You've definitely set out your vision there, um, but you used the word collaboration or collaborative approach, and that is really essential so that we, um, you know, all work together to get the best result. Scotland's leading the way, obviously, on renewables. Um, we have the cheapest form of, of uh, generation with onshore wind and provided, um, you know, we can use the planning laws, etc., cetera, to, um, to encourage more of it where it is uh, best located, which is Scotland, the North, Wales, islands, then, um, you know, we need to work together to achieve the right ends. Um, but yeah, I definitely think the vision is there. It's um, having the the collaborative approach to go ahead and deliver that. Okay, Professor Bell. Yeah, I don't see any contradiction really between what the energy strategy is setting out in respect of the electricity system. It, you know, the ambition, uh, the role of the the regulated electricity network utilities is to facilitate whatever the market wants. There's a role to be played, and I think this has been a successful role that the Scottish Government has taken over the last sort of 10, 15 years, is creating that sort of um, environment for investment, kind of building up confidence for the market, so the people who are developing the generation facilities in particular, to an extent attracting demand, you know, whatever the, the new kind of businesses are that are going to utilise the electrical energy. Um, so, you know, in terms of facilitation, yeah, the, the regulatory framework is, is important for that. And as we were just, just, just talking about a few moments ago about the economic development of the network and its facilities. So, yeah, I see no contradiction really in terms of what the Scottish Government aspires to and uh, I think what would be required by the licenses of the various network companies. I think there are some details to be worked out. I think some of the kind of market arrangements are uh, in my opinion, starting to struggle a little bit with the transition that we've, that we've, we're familiar with for the, the whole electricity system. I think there is a need for some deep consideration of what those, uh, what the solutions might be. But I think in that respect, uh, the Scottish Government doesn't have it within its gift to, to drive those, but it has already, I think, made quite a, a positive impact in terms of encouraging the UK level debate on a lot of those things. There is a strong knowledge base within Scotland. Uh, not not just within within the kind of okay not just within within the civil service but the fact that there are uh, two uh, transmission companies and distribution companies that are here that have a strong base of knowledge internally that can inform the wider debate and kind of the academic community and so on so the contribution is already there in terms of informing that wider gp discussion and uh, i would look to, to that to continue because what we would want to get out of it would be good for scotland and it would be good for gp as well thank you uh, I'll move on to a question from John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener and uh, 
maybe the theme of balance is one that uh, goes through a lot of the questions uh, today, because I suppose as I'm looking at it, uh, on the one hand, we've got uh, a lot of um, renewable renewables coming through. Um, I mean, just yesterday, some of us visited uh, in Methyl to see about the hydrogen that uh, work that's been doing there. But it did strike me as that is still quite in the early stages. So, I mean, how reliant can we be on these renewable sources and how much should we be looking at thermal generation? And then against that, how much should we be looking at demand reduction? So I have to say, I find it difficult to get the balance in there. Mr. Yeah, Hart. I think, um, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a great question, yeah, and um, one that we're looking at very closely. Uh, Scotland already has one of the lowest carbon grids in Europe and really is leading in Europe with Portugal and Denmark in terms of the growth of renewables and decarbonisation. Uh, we see, as we look forward through the 2020s to 2030 and beyond, the need for a very low carbon electricity grid to underpin uh, the decarbonisation of transport and, and the heat sectors, which is recognised in, in the strategy. Um, essential to that will be a good mix uh, of low carbon sources, be they thermal with CCS, uh, nuclear and renewables, all in the mix we see going forward, particularly once uh, growth in heat demand on electricity begins, which could be very significant and very peaky. Um, but we absolutely are confident that we have the tools and resources that we need to balance and retain the security of the grid under a wide range of scenarios over the next 15, 20 years, both very high renewables grids, but also grids with uh, large thermal generation on the nuclear on them as well. Um, when we model the, the Scottish grid, as we've been doing with Scottish Power and SSE, uh, we can see that it is uh, perfectly feasible to operate uh, the grid in Scotland solely on renewables. And indeed, that regularly occurs at the moment. The only large thermal power station left in Scotland is Peterhead, and it doesn't run very often. So we, we have regular periods of time where Scotland is entirely operating uh, on renewable power. So would we need any new thermal? The implication of that is no. I, I, we can operate the grid without it. I think we, we're moving from a world where a lot, a lot of the arrangements were orientated around large thermal power to Keith's point around changes in the market. That has fundamentally, it's already fundamentally changed over the last five years, and it will continue to change as those thermal power stations that are left operate less and less. Um, I, I expect us to move to a world where the there will be a, a lower number of residual thermal power stations left, and ideally I'd like to see those spread around the country in a relatively uniform way to give us options on how we manage the grid. That makes sense. Uh, that will require changes to arrangements over time. Um, but uh, that's something we're looking at very closely with the Scottish companies and with uh, industry as a whole. I mean, do any of the others think we're being over-optimistic about renewables? Or maybe we're being not optimistic enough? Professor Bell? Depends what you're trying to achieve, whether you're looking at it in an optimistic way or a pessimistic way, I suppose. But um, uh, in terms of the need for thermal plant as such, uh, I, would, I would characterise the issue of being about you know, the operation of the system and the ability to operate it under a wide range of conditions, being about sort of schedulable resources. So resources that you can kind of control or determine what they're going to be doing, some some period ahead of time, so a few hours ahead, a day ahead. Um, so so uh, wind and solar are not, not strictly schedulable in that sense. You can turn them down. If it's windy, you can, you can switch them off. But, but if it's not windy, you can't switch them on. You can't switch the wind farms on. So they're not, not quite the same thing. Now, conventional thermal generation is schedulable in that sense, albeit the nuclear plant, which makes use of steam, so in a sense it's thermal as well, uh, the, the stations, the designs that we've had to date in in, uh, in Britain, are not terribly flexible. They do have some flexibility and, and schedulability, therefore. But these other resources, it could, could be hydro, it could be interconnectors, um, yeah, it could be uh, all sorts of other you know, thermal plant. So there are there are different options. But to be able to kind of have this level of control under a range of circumstances does, I think, give the system operator a degree of comfort about making sure under you know, a wide range of situations, for example, bad weather's coming through or whatever, that the, con the supply to consumers will be continuous. 
Then okay. Duncan, or, sorry, and I think everyone else wants to come in as well. So perhaps start with Duncan, then Barbara, and then Emma. Yeah, just to, to, to echo Keith's point and build on it, I think we look when we look forward, we have a very diverse range of sources that we can use um, alongside thermal. So we have the growth in pump storage, potentially, particularly in Scotland. Uh, battery storage is along, alongside that. Um, the, the potential for demand side services to play a significant role in future balancing and also interconnection both into Scotland and into the GB market more widely give us an awful lot of options to help operate that grid. And it is worth bearing in mind that already renewables provide a significant number of services to the grid in terms of voltage support and now frequency support, which allow us to help operate the grid very securely with renewables in, in the way that we would have done historically uh, with thermal plant. So I, e even, a, even the most cold-hearted uh, engineer looking at this can see that we have the ability to use other sources of controllable power to help manage the grid. The classic situation everyone talks about is very low renewables. We know that we can operate Scotland under very, very low renewables. It's a question of, at a GB level, where we get the alternative supplies from, whether that's pump storage, battery storage, demand side, etc. Yeah, um, I, I was going to come at that from a, a different angle. It was about the operability of the system and what exactly um, the existing and new players can offer. Um, we're seeing lots of what they call disruptor um, parties coming in, aggregators, battery storage, that technology is improving. We've got wind farms that are looking to um, repower, to reconfigure their footprint, to include solar and battery in order to maximise the capability of the connection. And one of the things that um, Grid have, uh, have said they will look at is how we procure and um, attract ancillary services. So we've done a bit of work recently on um, what the current procurement process is uh, for ancillary services and what it might look like in a new world. So I remember getting a bit techy many years ago being uh, on a grid code panel and um, some of the operatives at National Grid having a presumption about how a wind farm um, operated and suddenly someone <clears throat> might have said, have you ever been out to one to have a look at what's ca uh, possible? So a trip was visit uh, was organised up to um, to one of the wind farms. Um, I can't remember which one it is. It's Crystal Rig, wasn't it? Yeah. And, uh, and suddenly, you know, the blinkers were taken away, eyes were, eyes were wide of sources, and um, Grid actually could see what the operation of a wind farm was like. And that was way back then. The technology's improved, you know. We, we need to have a more collaborative approach to ancillary services provision, and we need to get some of these new disruptors in around the table um, so that Grid can explain to them what the problem is on the grid, operability-wise, and then they can tell us about what the potential new solutions are. So it's it's thrown away the old rule book and the, the old approach, and it is being more collaborative and more collegiate um, to understand what what the new possibilities are. And it's not picking one winner; it could be a whole range of them uh, working in tandem. And Emma Kelso. Uh, I was going to make uh, similar points about the role that uh, demand side response and uh, battery storage in particular can can, can uh, play in this area. Uh, Ofgem is currently working with UK government and with uh, uh, wider stakeholders, including industry, uh, to look at how we can make sure that there aren't undue barriers uh, to, to these uh, technologies being able to uh, emerge and continue to grow. Uh, just picking up on the point about ancillary services, again, we're, we're working closely with, with National Grid. Um, we think it is important that there's as much transparency as, as possible in this area, particularly for new technologies, uh, so that they can understand, they can have a conversation with National Grid about look, how, can, how can new technologies participate in the various uh, ancillary services that are on offer and I'm sure Duncan will be able to go into detail if if you'd like on some of the new services that uh, National Grid have brought in uh, over the last couple of years again to help uh, with that transition to a lower carbon economy. Thank you and I think there's a follow-up in this area from Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you convener. If um, and although you might not agree that um, 
you know, thermal should continue in Scotland, but if it, it does for the next five, ten years, does the site, let's say, that we have at Peterhead, is it fit for purpose? Should it be refurbished? Or should we perhaps start again at one of the existing central belt former thermal sites? Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I w if it's okay, I won't comment on the particular strategy of an individual, uh, a separate company. I, um, I, what I would observe is that across uh, Great Britain, um, the, the cost of the establishment of the, the network to connect a power station uh, is expensive and uncertain, both in terms of planning and in terms of investment. So many parties have chosen to use existing sites for the construction of uh, new power stations, indeed the most recent connection. The most recent connecting CCGT at Carrington uh, in New Manchester was built uh, right next to an existing substation. So that is usual that that, that happens. Um, I, I'd also say that, you know, we see in our future energy scenarios that CCS is a, has a, an important role to play in delivering the lowest cost, low carbon grid that we can get and the CCS sites would necessarily tend to be on the east coast of England. Um, and both, uh, both Long Island and Peterhead sites have had historic discussions around CCS connection to them. So without getting into the particulars, um, it, the use of an existing site would seem entirely consistent with the strategies adopted by most power companies in the UK, and both of those look consistent with the CCS strategy. That's probably as far as I can go. <laughs> And maybe I can add briefly, uh, it's up to the market basically to decide what sites to develop and whether what condition the existing sites are in, the existing equipment, what degree of refurbishment or whatever, come up with a, a price for providing their services. So, you know, as Duncan says, an existing site is, has obvious advantages. Um, I think the, the procurement of enough capacity, generation capacity as a whole, for, for the, you know, it's a GB system and we get a lot of benefits in, up here in Scotland from being part of a GB system, both in terms of supporting the times when, it, when it's low wind, for example, and providing a market when it's high wind. For the GB system as a whole, there is, you know, as we're aware of, there's a capacity market now that is intended to deliver enough as a whole. One thing that I think should be looked at, actually, is the sort of locational value within that, because there are system operation services that come from a particular location. So part of it is to do with voltage control or, or managing the power flows under particular conditions relative to the network capacity. So the way of kind of coherently thinking of all of these different services together as a package, I think is quite difficult at the moment when we have a range of different ancillary services that are procured in different ways. I mean, I think, to be fair to National Grid, they, they try, try extremely hard to get best value out of those services. Um, but sometimes they're a bit kind of... I mean, and there are reasons for having different services as well. There are different technical requirements. But the whole package and how that is considered, I think, is something that um, we should be looking at, actually. And, that, and so, for example, includes the locational value, if you want to put it like that. Just, just to come back on that, yeah, I think, as Emma alluded today, we, we are doing a lot of work on how the markets for the services we buy, which is a small proportion of the overall market for electricity, less than 1%. But... Um, uh, how, the, how that, those services we buy change. So, in fact, today we're publishing something called the System Needs and Product Strategy, which is our way of looking at uh, saying, OK, this is technically what we need to operate the system, and this is how we think the markets for those services should evolve over the next 10 years. Uh, alongside that, we've done major new tender rounds, such as the Enhanced Frequency Response Tender, the largest uh, effectively battery tender in the world uh, about two years ago bringing forward significant volumes, 200 megawatts of very fast control plant right across GB. So there, there, is, there is a need uh, and a response from us in terms of clarity and information to make sure that we facilitate that rapid transition. But there will be questions for everyone uh, during that, particularly you know, in the investment cycle around existing and new power stations. Right, a question from Jackie Bailey. Um, I want to turn to transmission charging, um, principally because I think what you've had a review, there have been some conclusions of that review by Ofgem in 2014. Sorry, this is buzzing, which has put me off. Um, so in 2014, you went to a peak security tariff and a year-round tariff. Can somebody just explain the difference to me and the value of each? 
No, Mr. Hanto, if, if you have them, Duncan, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but I can come in on the more I, general framework. I haven't got the numbers, actually. Um, but, yeah, do you, want, well, do you want to do the more general framework? Uh, so, in terms of the, I, I guess, the overall framework, uh, transmission charges have two components to them. So, one is a cost-reflective charge and one is a residual charge. Uh, that means that the, uh, the charges that any individual either d demand customer, so households, businesses, and, and so on, or indeed a generator will will pay will depend on where they're located and how they use how they use the trans transmission network. Uh, and as you say, we did do a significant piece of work which culminated in 2014-15 uh, to overhaul uh, these charges. As a result of that, we have seen quite significant reductions in charges for uh, intermittent generators in particular, uh, so particularly for wind farms, uh, some smaller re reduction for, for some thermal generators as well. Have you got a scale for that, just to get an idea of you know, what they were paying before and has it halved, is it...? Um, off the top of my head, I believe the numbers have come down for um, wind generators by approaching 20%. Um, that's a ballpark number. I suggest that we perhaps write to you with a, a more specific figure after, after okay. the session. I think that would be helpful given yep. Scotland's reliance on, on wind generation, just to appreciate that. Sure. Um, I wonder if you could set out the role that transmission charging plays um, in encouraging new thermal generation. Yeah, sure. So, um, the historic framework provides for a, a locational signal in the charges to indicate where it would be more or less expensive to to connect generation to the system. Generally, that's meant that charges for generation are higher in the north, and particularly higher in Scotland, and then lower as you get into the Midlands, uh, and the lowest, or indeed negative, in central London, where, of course, it would be very hard to build a large power station, but where there's an awful lot of demand. Um, that's... That was reviewed at the, at the last major review, as you say, uh, and some adjustments were made to how that would work, particularly for the balanced for intermittent or variable generation. Um, I see that continuing to develop. I, you know, I've said already that the amount that thermal stations are running is continuing to decline year on year as, as renewables become more and more pre prevalent, and that's particularly the case in Scotland. Um, there is an ongoing charging process discussion at the moment uh, where... SSE have raised a modification to look at the charging arrangements for thermal generation in Scotland. And uh, that's a proposal which would reduce significantly the charges for thermal generation in Scotland. And that's, that's something that National Grid is supporting in terms of the adjustments that that would make to the signals. And, and that reflects the fact that the way the network is being used is continuing to change and, in, and indeed is changing more rapidly than we would have expected even three or four years ago due to the continued growth of renewables, in particular solar in England, and continued robust growth of renewables in Scotland, um, which is both a, a, a fantastic thing for, for the decarbonisation of the grid and also in terms of the gro continued growth of wind in Scotland, a signal that um, the revisions made over the last three years to charges have not stymied the continued growth of wind development in Scotland. Let, let me take this just slightly further. Sorry, and others may, may, may want to come in. Um, you're very positive about renewables, and that's to be welcomed. I'm wondering, though, what new thermal capacity has been generated, aside from the nuclear plant, plant at Hinkley. I mean, I, I'm, I'm concerned, as you are, with keeping the lights on. So, you know, where is that new thermal coming from? Is it required, or is it not? We now have, as of last year, we have a fully functioning capacity <laughs> mechanism across Great Britain, which is setting against a reliability standard that's agreed and confirmed by uh, the Westminster government, is then setting a target for uh, the capacity market to deliver enough capacity to ensure continued and consistent reliability of supply at a GB level. Um, those, those processes are working very well, we think. Um, in terms of the connection of new capacity, as I said, the last large thermal power station that connected is, is Carrington near Manchester. Um, there's nothing, well, and we see regular participation of other large stations in the capacity mechanism. To date, there's been a very diverse range of successful participants in that, from, from the very large to the very small. And I think, you know, one of the important components is to recognise that in future security of supply is going to come from a very diverse range of sources. The, the large stations that we, we know and love, 
from uh, smaller sites that can provide occasional power when it's needed for a few hours, uh, from batteries, from interconnection. And we, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges that we face as an industry is, is being able to look at these fundamental questions of national importance, such as security of supply and grid resilience, but look at them anew and not cling to the way we have run it for the last 20, 30 years, as Barbara says. We've all had to transform our own thinking as to how we can operate the grid to make sure that we get best value for consumers out of the existing mix. I wonder if I could bring in Richard Leonard, I think, as a supplementary on this. Um, actually, I've got a very particular question which is not quite related to this directly. Do you want me to ask it all the same? Why not? Right, OK. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask, because this is a Scottish Parliament committee, I wanted to ask about um, interconnectors to the island and, uh, and, and where, where that stands. I mean, uh, my source tells me that the Conservative Party manifesto in the election last week contained a commitment to island wind. So I wonder whether you've already begun to think about uh, the steps that you need to take to put in place the infrastructure, the interconnectors, uh, that will bring that to fruition? Uh, that is a very active and ongoing conversation with, uh, Scottish, uh, with SSC transmission and with Scottish Power transmission. Um, we have good plans in place uh, and the, the technical plans available for the, for the connection of island wind. The policies around how that's done and funded is very much a broader question for, for government and Ofgem. But, um, yeah, we, we see no challenge with it other than, uh, like any major piece of infrastructure, there's, it's a significant engineering undertaking to, to build those links, but it, but it can be done and we have the plans to do it. So you've got the technical plans to do it, but you don't have the budget for it? The funding, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Briefly on, mm. on off Jim's role. Mm. So uh, off Jim's role is to is first of all to approve uh, a, a connection if there's a, a case made. Uh, in doing that, we need to make sure that the uh, that there is definitely going to be actual use of that uh, of that cable. So uh, that that's the first step that we go through. Uh, once that has been agreed, uh, then we can go through the the usual processes and the usual uh, charging regime would apply. Thank you. Now, a question from Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I have a number of questions about um, Black Start and re-energising the system. Um, the last time the committee looked at this, two or three years ago, my understanding of the situation was uh, pump storage hydro would kick in first, followed by thermal uh, conventional power stations and then nuclear plants. Now, Long Gannett's out of the picture and we now have Peterhead that's filling the breach. Uh, what I wanted to ask you about was a letter from a uh, National Grid to Ofgem dated May 2016. And it says, for the purpose of Black Star, the country is split into six zones, of which Scotland is one of those six zones. Two units per zone are required to Black Star simultaneously. National Grid's policy states that three units should be contracted in each zone. Can you tell me how many units are contracted in Scotland? Number of units contracted in Scotland. Um, so we, the major contracts are, well, with two uh, of the pub storage stations, as you say, uh, and then we have parallel contracts uh, to thermal generation in order to restart. We don't discuss publicly the, the the specific names and the detail, obviously, of the stations involved, but I'm sure the committee can. So thermal station other than Peterhead located in Scotland that could. It be in that process? Well, the, the Black Star contracts specifically are with the pump storage plant, and then we have, or with hydro plant, and we have a number of smaller hydro stations which also participate in the, in the initial Black Star to connect much of the demand in northern Scotland alongside the large process of um, pump storage to large thermal plant. And we have arrangements in place to use uh, power stations in northern England alongside those available in Scotland. Uh, should we need to in order to facilitate a speedy black start of Scotland? In terms of the time scale for, for black start, and I'm happy for other members of the committee, uh, the panel to come in rather than, uh, you know, conversation between Duncan Burton and myself. Um, in terms of the time scale for uh, black start, um, my understanding is you're hoping to get 95% of Scotland up and running within 24 hours. Um, but again, that same letter said 
Within 12 hours of a total system shutdown, National Grid's electricity transmission strategy in the event of Black Start is designed to achieve restoration of the network within industry expected 12 hours. Why Scotland 24 when you're, ex you're expecting to do 12? Um, I need to check the precise wording of the letter. The, the, our standards haven't changed, which is that we expect to get about 95% of the network, the vast majority of the network, energised uh, within the first 24 hours, and alongside that to achieve the restoration of around 60% of demand at a, at a GB level. And we expect that to be spread broadly, uniformly across Great Britain as well. Um, it's within within the components of how we do that black start we have changed our strategy over the last three years and we continue to adjust it to bring more options and more competition into the market as as you say uh, the number of thermal power stations that we have available declines so uh, we've moved to what we call a spinal strategy which uh, and well, we're gradually moving to a more a full of spinal strategy which allows us to put a larger proportion of the network together earlier and then connect uh, generation into it uh, as it comes online. That gives us more diversity of options on black start stations and allows us to use stations outside of a zone, a particular zone, be it the north of England, Scotland or southern England, in order to facilitate restoration right across the country. And that's something we've used to uh, both mitigate or militate against the risk of closure of stations such as Long Gannett uh, and also stations closure of stations in England and Wales and it allows us to make sure that on the day of a black start we can adjust our plans based on those stations that are available to make sure that we bring supplies back on as, as you'd expect as, as quickly as we can so that that spinal strategy means that we don't any longer just focus on restarting particular regions on their own it means that we grow the network earlier and then bring power stations onto it now that's it's a different technical process in, in i won't say it's more complex it is just different so it's something which we will build in stage, stages with the distribution networks who are critical to this because they they reconnect the supply as we go but uh, the very early the very first one of those has been to merge the two historic plans in scotland for the north and the south of scotland into a single zone for the restart of scotland I'll ask you specifically about the UK in a minute, but um, I want to ask you a hypothetical uh, question based on real-life situation. See, I've got an elderly constituent who lives in a, rem a, a remote rural part of, of the country and it depends on electric heating. How long would it take for them to be reconnected? And how long? How does that compare with, say, the situation five years ago? I, the timescales are broadly consistent with as they were five years ago and our aim uh, very clearly is to maintain the consistency of those restoration times. Um, you are always more likely to lose uh, supplies due to a very local power cut uh, related to the distribution network than you are related to a major national shutdown. Um, if we had a major national shutdown it is likely to be linked to uh, you know, a significant event, maybe a major uh, weather storm such as in 1987 across the south of England, or indeed uh, an act of terrorism or other malevolent act onto the, onto the electricity system as a whole. So we look, we look at resilience in total. Um, we plan for a very robust and speedy restoration, which will give policymakers the choice as to how to direct power, uh, certainly after the first 24 hours. Uh, but we do know that for some areas of the some areas of the country, not necessarily remote rural, particularly in Scotland, where uh, the, the smaller hydro stations in the north and down in Dumfries and Galloway could provide early support into those rural networks. But for some areas of the network, both urban and rural, it could be up to several days before everyone gets all of the power back that they need. So that's why um, resilience planning is intimately involved in well, an intimate role of local government to work on the resilience plans for each region, building up to national resilience plans involving the police and hospitals and everything else. And you, you would expect us, for such a significant event, to have very robust plans in place that we practice regularly to ensure that if the worst does happen and we have to do it, that we can 
make sure that every constituent that you have is on as quickly as you can. You will understand, though, that it does take time and that choices have to be made within that process. Um, going, going on to the, the GB system as a whole, uh, and you mentioned the 1987 storm when um, there was loss of power in the south, south of England. Um, in the, the event of a complete GB shutdown, and given that you've got these six um, zones or power islands or whatever you want to refer to them as, um, what's the priority in getting those up and running? I, the, the priority is to get the electrical network back and functioning as a strong system, uh, given that it will have been significantly impeded by, by the complete shutdown. Um, we, we expect the progression of the event to mean that, as, as I said, we get the vast bulk of the network back and energised in the first 24 hours. Is that uniform across the UK yeah. or in certain areas or what is that? No, that's, that's uniformly across the UK. Um, and one of the reasons I'm very clear that it's uniformly across... I'll use the word broadly uniform because, it, you know, within an hour or two it may be different. Um, one of the reasons to do that is because resilience is managed at a regional level. Um, and at a national level for Scotland and for Wales. So it, it is key, we think, that, that, that power is available right across the country to provide support to critical local infrastructure. Um, with government, we're looking very closely at that at the moment as part of the... to make sure that as the, the electrical system goes through the very significant transformation that it is, that we have the, the right plans in place in terms of speed of connection and resilience of network. We're working very closely with uh, the network companies in Scotland and in England to make sure that the critical role that the network will play and the resilience needed from that network during the process is, is there. And, um, yep, I, I mean, all of those things have got to come together to work well. After the first 24 hours, it, dependent on the situation, it may be possible for policymakers to begin making choices around where that power goes. We would expect, and our plans are for that power to continue to be fed uniformly uh, around the country where it's needed. And you mentioned the interconnectors. Um, we could be dependent on the thermal plants in the northeast and northwest of England. Um, but if the thermal connectors to from the UK to Europe wouldn't be working in the event of a GB shutdown. Would the interconnectors between Scotland and England be working? They would, yeah. They would. They're an integral part of the GB network, so yeah, right. they would continue to operate and they can form a fundamental part of a right. black start. So, so my final question is, is about the EU interconnectors, the ones we've got with France, Belgium and Netherlands, etc. Um, you know, as, as the thermal capacity in the UK continues to drop, um, you know, what impact would Brexit have on Black, Black Star and the broader system security if, if the deal isn't, if it's a hard Brexit or we walk away without a deal? So, I mean, we, without getting into hypotheticals, I, I mean, the UK is very much linked into the broader European market and uh, we, we at National Grid have said that it's beneficial for the UK to continue to be an active participant in that broader European market, predominantly because it delivers uh, a lower cost to a lower, a lower price to consumers in Great Britain, being part of that bigger market. Um, however, we have the capacity mechanism arrangements covering GB that look at the level of security that we need. Um, the vast bulk of capacity for GB is delivered within GB, with only a small proportion being delivered by. Yeah, exactly. Uh, relatively small. So um, low numbers. That, you know, under most scenarios, you could happily replace, even at short notice, you could replace that interconnection capacity with uh, GB capacity. Um, we'd, we'd, we would obviously, I mean, working very closely with government on uh, the evolution of the energy market as part of Brexit, we'll continue to look at that um, as, as the next couple of years progresses. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. Sorry, Certainly, I, yes. I, I was just going to add on the uh, the, the Brexit uh, situation. We're currently going through a phase where we're um, through something called um, 
the EU network codes, we're looking to harmonise arrangements, and those uh, uh, are progressing to a point where we're almost at implementation. In fact, some of them are, uh, are nearly there. So, um, you know, our preference would be to still be part of all of that. However, you know, whatever happens with the Brexit arrangements, we would expect that stakeholders would be consulted um, in order to see, you know, what what stands and what falls by the by. Um, but our members are, are, you know, interested in making that work. If, if I could just uh, add a point. Um, so Ofgem also considers that um, the interconnectors play a, a helpful role in uh, in security of supply. Uh, obviously, the, the ex precise way that we'll be able to trade across those interconnectors remains to be seen, depending on on on, on the ulti ultimate arrangements that come out of Brexit. Uh, one thing that's worth noting is that the way that the capacity market works is it, it actually it, it, it derates interconnectors when it takes in, so it's taking into account how how much it thinks it can rely on an interconnector being there when it's needed. Now, obviously, if, if needed, those derating factors could be adjusted in future capacity market rounds uh, so that we could adjust the amount of capacity that's procured uh, within within the, the UK um, if we cannot rely on the interconnectors as much. I might just make just one very general comment to this kind of strand of, of discussion, which is that, you know, things are changing and there are all these uncertainties. You know, Brexit is one of them. The generation mix is changing. I think the key thing is that uh, you know, the main parties that are responsible for ensuring kind of continuity and security of supply for the GB system and all the kind of regions they're in and Scotland and Wales and so on, it's continually kept under review, really, that, that you know, it's an active process of checking that the existing arrangements and procedures are appropriate. Uh, because, you know, we, we can never say exactly what, you know, what, Black starts. We haven't needed it in GB, but you can never say you, you never say never. You know, um, so yeah, it's just the key thing that, that everything is kept under under review and kept up to date. And I think it's very encouraging that that Bayes has established this uh, kind of working group that, that Duncan mentioned. From my own kind of contacts with various parties, I'm encouraged that it is being taken seriously. Um, and you know, there's a, I think there is a step forward in, in the, the seriousness that, with which it's being taken right now, we st there's still a lot of work to be done, you know, but uh, it is going in the right direction. And of course, what we look for is that that is brought through in a timely fashion. Hopefully, no, any, any delays don't matter because it's a very unlikely thing, but you, you know, you always want to talk. I mean, I know Duncan's talked about it being kind of an insurance policy you want to have in place. So in respect of kind of everyday security of supply, which is like the capacity market, and in respect of these very rare things, yeah, you just want to make sure the facilities are there and kept up to date uh, and continually under review. Thank you. And questions from Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, Convener. I want to move on to talk about Scotland's energy efficiency programme. Um, clearly, there are a growing number of um, local uh, initiatives taking place, generating both uh, energy and involved in energy efficiency. So we have off-grid completely in the island of Egg. Uh, yesterday we visited uh, Leavenmouth and saw the generation of fuel for transport and electricity on an off-grid but parallel connected to the grid. Uh, we looked at St Andrews, which is generating district heating um, and hopefully electricity um, in future as well to make St Andrews um, a carbon neutral uh, uh, university. Um, are there are there regulatory and, and technical issues around local solutions to energy generation and energy efficiency um, fit, 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 fit fit for purpose, um, or are there challenges there that we need to be aware of? Shall I kick off? Um, so I, I think, as, as you've rightly pointed out, this is a sort of a constantly moving target, if you like. Um, so it is important that we make sure that uh, regulatory arrangements rem remain fit for purpose. Um, there are a number of, of, of planks to that, uh, both looking on the generation side, so looking at embedded generation, for example, uh, also potentially on the on, on the retail side. So we're seeing increasingly um, local authorities and the, the, the possibility for Scottish government as well to, to, to come involved and, and to be making uh, retail offerings 
offerings. And obviously, any generator, any uh, retail supplier has to have a license. Uh, there is a, re a regulatory architecture in place uh, to make sure that um, that anybody participating in the market sticks sticks to the rules. Um, but it's important that the the detail uh, that sits beneath that is able to evolve as we move through time. Uh, Ofgem is working closely with with Scottish government uh, and with UK government and and with stakeholders uh, to make sure that we play our part in, in, in making sure those arrangements are as fit for purpose as possible. And uh, recently we've, uh, we've responded to uh, Scottish Government consultations uh, on, on these issues as well. Barbara um, Vess. Yeah, we, we've uh, long promoted the adoption of a whole systems approach. So that should look at power, heat and transport together. Um, and it's very important to get this regulatory framework right. So we've called for a, a review of a holistic review of charging, because let's face it, you know the the regime we have at the moment um, looked at a traditional model where you had all of the big generation kit uh, connected to the transmission system and demand at the uh, at the network lower network system, and that isn't the picture now. So we need to make sure that the arrangements aren't barriers to entry for you know more uh, energy efficiency, demand side initiatives, et cetera, to um, get up and running. Um, we need stability in policies, so therefore a review of charging alongside a review of ancillary service provision, you know, hand in hand, um, is very important. Um, and that should look at all of the charging, it should look at um, balancing services, use of system costs, it should look at interconnector costs, because there isn't a level playing field applied there uh, compared to you know what some users have to pay. Um, but one of the things that um, I think we really, really need to be careful of and, and, and make sure that we're uh, embracing is whatever we propose with regard to energy efficiency, say we have to ensure that we educate consumers because this is a huge impact on them. Um, you know, we have to uh, explain to them what the impact will be on their bill for all of these initiatives. We have to carry them with us, um, but we also have to ensure that they're willing to um, to play their part because some of it in the initial stages, you know, if we were to sort of green the, uh, the heat uh, system or go for more electrification, that's going to be... Um, a big overhead for them with regards to time and conversions and uh, things like that. And there's also area, in the energy efficiency area, there are things that we could encourage those who are able to pay to participate in, um, which should help as well. But if all of those things reduce um, demand on the system, if we then go to an electrification for transport, that's going to increase um, the overheads. And again, this is where the education system comes in about explaining to people what the impact on their bills will be. Okay, I mean, some of this, um, the energy strategy, as you say, is, is quite ambitious. Um, and there will be points along this transition which will take us 10 to 20, 30 years to decarbonise and increase energy efficiency. There will be points along where we have to make very, very important decisions about, for example, um, hydrogen and the gas network. Um, I mean, how do we ensure that there is proper ownership of those decisions? Um, and related to that, given this is a long time scale, is there any benefit perhaps in some kind of independent body delivering the strategy or being accountable for the delivery of the strategy, given that governments come and go and parliaments come and go? Duncan Burke. Yeah, just, I, mean, I mean, a few points on that. I think, first and foremost, uh, clear strategy from government and consistency of policy uh, is really, really key. I, we really welcome uh, the work you've put together as Scottish Government on on the strategy and also that it is both ambitious but far-sighted in scale and, and covers everything from electricity through to transport and heat. And the benefits of such clear policy direction and consistency of direction is evidenced in the tremendous growth in renewables that Scotland has seen over the last 10 years. That is largely related, we think, to that clarity of policy uh, at a national level. Um, when we look at what is going to happen, I think it is 
you know, very important that we test and pilot uh, potential solutions alongside trying to design all this stuff up front. Barbara has mentioned very eloquently a couple of times the role of very new entrants in this and disruptors into the industry. I, you know, not all of the answers uh, for this revolution, both in the decarbonisation of electricity, but also transport and heat, and not all of the answers are going to come from the existing large players with the cap capability and capacity to engage in an extensive government review. Um, we found that through a wide programme that we have on demand side management called Power Responsive, which has got everyone from Tesla to the distribution networks to small and large uh, commercial entities such as retail in there, uh, participating in helping figure out what we should decide now and what we can leave to later. I, there's a very good report by McKinsey for the World Energy Forum earlier this year which v highlighted the tremendous value of optionality within the way that energy markets uh, and the decarbonisation of transport and heat will evolve over the next 10 and 20 years. And I, I think, consciously or not, that is recognised in, in the strategy as well, um, in the diversity of options around heat and in the need to move early in some areas. I, in terms of how that's done in Scotland, I would say that in Scotland you have two very active uh, and engaged large energy companies in, in SSC and Scottish Power, both very actively engaged and bringing international expertise, particularly in the form of eBadrona with Scottish Power, into the distribution networks in Scotland. Uh, a number of innovation projects up here are uh, being funded by Ofgem. And uh, across Scotland, you have uh, a tremendous wealth of smaller innovative energy, energy companies participating and helping lead uh, the debate from flexitricity uh, in Edinburgh to smarter grid solutions. Uh, and their partnerships with SSE and other companies uh, in, in innovation projects. You have some tremendous organisations up here and, and we should make sure that we use them heavily alongside experts such as Professor Bill. Right, thank you. We'll move on to a question from Gillian Martin. Yeah, my question is really largely asked because I was asking, I was going to be asking about how feasible you think the, the move from 15% to 50 within the next 10 years is going to be, but I think you've largely asked that. So I'm going to come on to something else, really, about the investment that people have made in, for example, wind turbines and how subsidy that was has been removed. Obviously, you've, you've, you've said some great things about how well we're doing in creating renewable energy in Scotland, and a lot of that potentially could be to do with the, the regime that was there to allow people to invest in, in expensive wind turbines. How do you see, I mean, what, what, would your, what would your message be in terms of the removal of that subsidy and how do you think what the impact is going to be in the future in growing um, the amount of people that are making that investment in, in renewable technologies? Okay, maybe it's my turn to try and kick off. Um, I think there's a real challenge just in general, for the contracting of electricity generation, uh, with the, the shift to low carbon energy means that you've got plants which has quite high capital cost, but, but low running costs. So the conventional way of running markets is really based on the short run costs. So oh, in, in a, a kind of fossil fuel dominated market, it's to do with the cost, the, the relative prices of different fossil fuels, you know, gas and coal competing with each other. And the way those markets would work would be whatever is the marginal unit sets the price for the market and everybody recovers all their money and you get a bit of a surplus which pays off your, your long run costs. But if everybody's just got very small short run costs and, and, and the market, the wholesale price is determined by that, it's very difficult to see how you can recover all of your long run costs. I think that's partly recognised by the institution of a capacity market just to try and make sure there's enough capacity there so to fill in some of that gap. I think we can see... That was also uh, somewhat the case in respect of uh, the contracts for difference that have been signed with low carbon generation, which uh, in the past has been onshore wind, solar PV and offshore wind, also Hinkley Sea, um, and it's promised for the future in respect of offshore wind, but not, as you've you know, highlighting, I guess, onshore wind. So I'm not sure that's really a consistent position, actually, in respect of the way to contract the cheapest forms of energy for you know, the GB consumer or the Scottish consumer or whoever. Um, that, you know, so it's, it's, it's a fundamental issue, I think, to do with the kind of the long run recovery of costs in a wholesale market that 
uh, it will be highly volatile in the times when you, you get, well, in, and it needs to be volatile to reflect those times of shortage, and they now allow some plant that only runs for a short period of time to recover its costs, but um, yeah, to give the confidence to investors over that period. So uh, I haven't thought this through enough, but I see some need for yeah, longer term procurement of, of energy. Uh, I was talking just recently with, with uh, a, a colleague from, from Chile who's with the system operator down there. Chile has actually been way ahead of the world in respect of electricity markets and, and the way that they've organised. They, they preceded us in terms of liberalisation. They'd done it in the 1980s, we did it in 1990. So I think there's a lot, to, there's a lot of value in looking at what they're doing. My understanding is that they are going to more of a kind of a slightly longer term, more centralised procurement, albeit competitively, of a range of types of generation, trying to make it as kind of technology neutral as possible. But um, that, in principle, if we see the cost of onshore wind, the levelised cost of onshore wind coming down to the, near the levels of, of, CT, of a new CTGT plant, would appear to give an opportunity for uh, onshore wind, which I think still remains, for our part of the world, the cheapest form of, of low carbon energy anyway. So yeah, I think there is a lot to be thought about there, which could lead to a fairly uh, wide-ranging change to the way that any type of generation capacity is procured, or uh, energy is, is procured. So I guess it comes back to consistency. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Um, I mean, our members are fully supportive of EMR, the capacity mechanism, the contracts for difference. And um, onshore wind has been proven as one of the cheapest form of renewables. So, you know, let's see onshore wind built where it's most efficient and effective. And, and where um, local communities support uh, the building of it. Um, the other thing to look at is, uh, as well is the repowering and um, more efficient use of e existing sites, um, you know, which is the next phase that we are looking towards. So if the planning regime is right and the will uh, is there, then we can get these projects up and built and running. The subsidy is a barrier towards um, onshore wind becoming uh, viable as a, a main source of energy. In the, in our, our, I'd say there are, there, are, there are many challenges there. Um, the removal of the subsidy hasn't helped, but we need to look at you know more efficient ways to deliver. Um, yeah, the problem is at the moment you know the policy is uncertain, and the sooner we get some certainty they're better all around for many areas, not just energy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. A question now from Ash Denham. Thank you. Um, the energy strategy obviously contains um, this proposal for a government-owned energy company. And um, at the moment, we're not exactly clear you know, what form that's going to take. So I'm just wondering what the panel's views on this. Do, do we think um, it's got the potential to address market failures and that it could invest in infrastructure? for instance, or do we think it would act more as a, an energy supplier, or should it be doing both of those types of things? Um, I, I think it's a very, it's a very interesting concept, and in some ways not, a, not an entirely new concept, as I, as I alluded to before. We have seen some, some public sector organisations, local authorities indeed, both, both in Scotland and England and Wales, already look to, uh, to, to gain uh, electricity supply licences. Uh, it's something that Ofgem is more than happy to work uh, with Scottish Government to explore. Uh, we have uh, recently set up something within Ofgem called the Innovation Hub, which is uh, something which is designed uh, for any, any industry player or potential industry player to be able to come along, ask questions and talk about perhaps a new a new concept, a new way of wanting to engage in the market and, and look at well what are the what are the regulatory um, barriers, what are the current rules, uh, what would perhaps need to change um, to, to be able to facilitate um, those new innovations. So we're, we're very, very supportive uh, of, of having further discussions on that. Um, I, I was just going to say that uh, this is a tremendous opportunity, but it could also be um, not so good an idea if it's not fully explored and the risks are properly assessed. Um, so, you know, I, I've recently been approached by uh, 
one of the local authorities to say, oh, should we get into this, Barbara? And, you know, my advice would be, you've got to research it. There are some very good operatives out there at the moment who are doing this already. Get out there and speak to them, find out what their experiences are so that you can fully assess the risks and the rewards. Um, speak to the regulator, find out, you know, what the, what the process is that you need to go to. And then once you've done all of that, sit back and double check what the others have done because that's not going to be a speedy process but it means you've had time to fully assess um you know what the opportunities are um others have done it some look like they're making a success of it so yeah i think it's a, a, a tremendous opportunity but there are also partnerships that you can do with the existing companies um and after all they know the system best so yeah i think um Get out there and explore it. I would just briefly add and say that I think Barbara's advice is very sound <laughs> on that. And um, a very good trade association as well. You'd um, be willing. You know, there, <laughs> there, there are risks. I mean, as you said, you know, we're not totally clear what what the Scottish government has has quite has in mind on this. Mm -hmm. One of the things may well be that you know, even just as a as a you know. It's a user of a large amount of energy itself and could strike a long-term contract which then helps to underpin investment in new renewables capacity so that could be a good thing but but yeah there are kind of you know there's a need to to know what you're doing in the in the marketplace i suppose is kind of the in a, in a nutshell like that's what you're saying barbara you know there are people who've got expertise with whom um the scottish government in whatever guise it wants to take this forward could um you should partner with and gain knowledge from Obviously, part of that is this idea of issuing the Scottish Renewable Energy Bond as a way of maybe financing, you know, support for Scotland's renewable sector, which comes on to Gillian Martin's question, you know, with subsidies being removed, do we see this as a way forward to finance renewables in Scotland now? I think this is a great idea, yeah. And I think there are bonds out there, you know, commercially available bonds that do a similar kind of thing. And, um, you know, it, it can play to individual citizens, individual investors, um, concerns about about the environment and sustainability and so on and 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 why not yeah right. well that that comes to the the end of our session today uh, this session that is thank you very much to all of our guests for coming in today and uh, I'll suspend this session so we can move into private session and allow the gallery to clear so thanks again to all of our guests for coming in today <laughs>